invite uh, Karen to introduce you, please. Tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, President Mark, members, guests, ke te mihi mahana katakoto. It is with great pleasure that I get to introduce this tenant, and we were lucky to have her as a member until recently, as you'll all recall. Liz is bringing a lifelong commitment to the talk today about pay equity, and she's got, really, quite frankly, a formidable uh, degree of relevant experience. She started her career in the Department of Labour, and rapidly, and I do mean rapidly, went on to become the CEO of the Central Clerical Workers' Union, and then she had nine very successful years as a Member of Parliament for Island Bay. She was a late Member of Parliament, as um, Mark told us at the beginning. And she was, uh, she was very influential in committee work. She worked in the policy areas of economic and regional development, employment, education and training, childcare, women's issues and employment relations. After leaving Parliament, Liz continued to work in the area of regional economic development and she went on to very rapidly again. She got into the New Zealand trade and enterprise and she developed particular expertise in tourism. Since 2009, Liz has been the CEO of Textiles New Zealand and currently she is now CEO, as Mark said, Community Law Centre's O Aotearoa. However, as well as all of that, if that's not enough to keep you busy, Liz has had numerous prominent governance roles. I'm serious. Half CV work, half CV all of the governance work. Too many to name, but what I do want to mention, she held several very senior party positions within the New Zealand Labour Party. She was a member of the Wellington Community Trust. She was appointed to the Tourism New Zealand Board and the Māori Subcommittee. Kerry should have been here. She's the chair of tourism. Being a, she's uh, been a member of the Tourism Wairapa Board and she became the chair. She was a member of the Whanganui River Boat Restoration and Navigation Trust. She was a ministerial appointment to the Taranaki Whanganui Conservation Board and she's been a member of the Coalition for Equal Value for Equal Pay for the past 11 years. Could you all join with me to welcome Liz Tennant. Uh, thank you very much, Karen, for that lovely introduction, and um, thank you, Mr. President. Pay equity. Now, what is that, and why is it an, an, an issue now? I'll give you a very quick history lesson, if I may. The, in 1972, which is now a long time ago, the Equal Pay Act was passed, and it provided for two main principles. One was equal pay for men and women doing the same job and it's probably fair to say that in most circumstances that has now been implemented. But it secondly also provided for equal pay for work of equal value which has been a bit more difficult for us all to understand but it's basically relating to having a look at the occupations that are predominantly being done by women and to assess them to see whether they are having their skills, responsibilities, etc., recognised when compared with um, an occupation that is predominantly filled by men. Now, the truth is that over that period of time, um, women do have worked and still do work in some quite particular industries. They're often called the caring industries, and it's in this area that we see the largest pay gap uh, that, has, that has emerged and continues to be prevalent uh, between what the pay between what men and women receive. Now, there are always lots of statistics thrown around, and um, I've left on your table a chart, which you might like to have a look at, which sets out the present status of the um, earnings between men and women in New Zealand at the moment. And you'll see that for a man who might earn 100% of the particular way, uh, the average wage, that for Pākehā women, 
they receive 84% of that wage. This is an average. For Asian women, 77%. For Māori women, 72%. And for Pacifica women, 67%. So there is still an, an unequal distribution of income that is occurring based on, uh, based on ethnic boundaries, but also particularly on male-female boundary. Now, why should we care? Um, and it's been a long history that I've actually been involved in, because I do care. In the late 1970s, I was actually the first person to take a claim to the then industrial court arguing a case for pay equity for a group of women who were working in an office role, uh, which in my opinion, were, they were not being paid the equivalent of what men would be paid if those men were doing those, those roles. That went to, uh, as I said, to the industrial court. I was a factory inspector with the Labor Department at the time. The case was thrown out, and the judge looked down his glasses, his, you know, those half glasses that you have, looked down at me and he said, this is like a case of Alice in Wonderland. I might say I was a bit annoyed about that, but anyway, you carry on. In the mid-1980s, I was involved in, uh, I was working for the Clerical Workers' Union, which is a predominantly, f it now no longer exists, as you probably know, um, office workers, 80% of whom were women, and we took a, a claim to the, um, then, I think it was then called the Employment Court, uh, on the basis of the pay rates of those office workers versus the pay rates that were paid in trades rates mainly for male occupations. That was, that was taken in the mid-1980s. That case was also thrown out. We now fast track to today's environment, and there's been a case going through the court, which has been known either as the Christine Bartlett case or the Terra Nova case. It's uh, behalf of, on behalf of Christine Bartlett, who is a uh, rest care worker working in one of the Terra Nova um, uh, rest homes, and, on, and the union on her behalf took a claim that because she was a woman working in a female predominant occupation, she was being underpaid. The reality was that she has worked in that job for some 16 years, and she was being paid 25 cents an hour above the minimum wage. The union took that claim, the employment court ruled in favour of the union claim. First time that the courts have ruled in favour of that pay equity argument. The employers then took it to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal ruled in favour of the union claim. And the judge said that there was obvious discrimination occurring, that the women in, the, in that occupation were being paid less because they were predominantly women and they were predominantly doing work which has been long considered to be woman's work, that is caring and other work that goes on in rest homes. Now when you think about that and you think about the job actually that those women are doing, you realise that they have to lift people around, it's a heavy job, they have to clean up dirty messes, it's a dirty job, and it requires a high level of social skills in dealing with those patients, dealing with the families, and grief counselling when those family members die. All of that takes up part of the job of a person, a woman, working in a rest care situation. And to be paid 25 cents an hour above the minimum wage after 16 years of service represents discrimination. The union put up a claim that said that the male comparator was worth probably $26 an hour. Now we are seeing a situation where a lot of claims have now been put forward to the court, uh, to the employment court as a result of this uh, uh, victory. 
and that there are some 3,000 claims now in front of the Employment Court representing disability workers, teachers' aides, uh, and other occupations that are predominantly filled by women. Now, quite naturally, the government got the wind up. <laughs> and the, what they've done is that they've set up two tripartite working groups, um, and those involved the uh, CTU, Combined Trade Unions, the Employers Association, and government officials. And there's been a tripartite working group working on the negotiations with regards to the Christine Bartlett case, and we are awaiting to see if what that outcome might be. But the second working group that they set up, which was a very important one, was called the Principles Working Group, and it was headed by Dame Pet Patsy Reddy, who is to be our new Governor-General. That committee um, worked hard over the last few months, uh, intensively, I might say, over the last few months, and they came up with a series of recommendations, which are that there needs to be a process established for dispute resolution in these sorts of claims, and that they recommended a process similar to the employment relations dispute resolution that we're now all familiar with, so that these matters can be resolved away from the courts and hopefully resolved by negotiation and by uh, proper evaluation of looking at jobs and evaluating them accordingly. Those recommendations, uh, which I might say I was thrilled to hear about, have now gone to Cabinet and they are sitting with Cabinet for Cabinet to make a decision on. What I'd like to say is that, in my opinion, we are at a watershed moment for women's real equality because it's a case of looking at the recognition of the skills, responsibilities, service, conditions of work and effort with male comparators. And if the government accepts these recommendations, then we are likely to see a far more uh, anti-discriminatory process evolving which will ensure that women are in fact paid what they should be paid. Now you might say to me, core blimey, what about the cost? And there is a cost. There is a cost. It's been estimated anywhere between $300 and $500 million as a cost. The judge in the Court of Appeal case actually commented on that issue, and he said that when slavery in the US was outlawed, the cost argument was put up and it was rejected because it was felt that the issue of equality was far more important and social justice was far more important. So he's, he's put that into that court decision and says that cost should not be a factor in trying to overcome what has been a long-held discrimination against female predominant occupations. I'd also put it out there, $500 million, yes, it is a lot of money. I'm sorry, Mr. President, but the Defence Force is talking of spending $20 billion over the next, what is it, 15 years? There is some $6 billion a year that is still not collected from fathers who, own, who owe child support. And the benefit that will go to these low-paid women will be immense. And it's not just to them, it's to their families. The huge level of poverty that we have in New Zealand in some sections of our community are, headed, uh, are families headed by women who are working in these sorts of jobs. And for them to get a pay rise will take their families out of poverty and I, I would submit, make a big difference and bene bring benefit to our society. So in summary, we are at a watershed moment. We either, as a nation, embrace the equality for women and their pay rates, or we don't. 
and we haven't for a long, long time. We haven't. But I'd ask you to support the call for women's equality and encourage Cabinet to do the right thing by adopting Dame Patsy Reddy's recommendations for pay equity. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got a few minutes for questions, so uh, questions from the floor. Liz, um, in the Bartlett case, mm -hmm. can you tell us what her salary or wage moved to once that court decision came through? Uh, it's it's not moved at all. She's, she's still on 25 cents above the minimum wage. Um, the matter is still being negotiated. Um, if the negotiations break down, then the union will take the matter back to the court. But it's now over, I think it's over two years now that this has been sitting there unresolved. And those thousands of women who are affected by it are still waiting. So you may well get a backdated position here. That is part of the negotiations. Bruce yeah. actually asked, asked my question, it's a supplementary there. Would it be backdated for her full 16 years? I have no idea. <laughs> it, it'd be great if it was, do you all agree? <laughs> um, these things are negotiated and I'm not part of the negotiating party, have a very keen eye and interest in what they're doing, but they will decide, hopefully, get a negotiated settlement. If they don't, it will go back to the court. And Liz, the, um, that figure you gave of the cost, of course, that needs to be put alongside the uh, extra profits, if you like, that have been made by employers. Uh, over many, many years by underpaying women, which seems entirely unjust. There's a great justice in actually uh, making a good commitment mm. from government. Mm. Thank you, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Well, yes, that is a hard one, and I know that the uh, Rest Homes Association is in heavy negotiations with the government on this very issue. And quite frankly, to resolve the whole, or to eradicate the discrimination that has occurred over a long time for women in these caring roles, often connected to the health sector, um, it, does, it does mean the government is going to have to pay more money. Now, I looked at the budget very carefully when it came out this year. Uh, there was no line item which allowed for $500 million <laughs> extra expenditure. But they do have a provision for contingent liabilities. Um, and I think that as a society, we have to face up to what's happened. There has been a move over many years to contract out a lot of this role um, and it was done to keep costs down. Who paid for that? A lot of it was paid for by those women workers. And maybe there needs to be a bit of rebalancing going on here. Um, and that's really what we're talking about. Thanks. Uh, Heather, the first thing to end.
The, the Nordic countries, uh, Scandinavian countries, have always been far more advanced than what we have in all sorts of areas. And their uh, pay gap between men and women is considerably less. Um, they also appreciate that it's not just issues to do with the actual pay rates that women are paid within predominantly female occupations. It's also to do with the whole equality of opportunity that needs to embrace that. Um, I'm going to be critical and say that I think the latest debate that we've been through in New Zealand about extending the, pay, uh, the parental leave has been a disaster, quite frankly. 18 weeks of parental leave, paid parental leave, to expect a woman who is still breastfeeding her baby to go back to work within 18 weeks um, and pick up her job, um, that's, that's not a policy that supports women. It doesn't support families. It doesn't support the care of the young child. If you look to the Scandinavian countries, they have parental leave of 12 months, in some cases even 18 months. And can I dare say that in Sweden, and I'm not necessarily promoting this, but you can think about it, they make it compulsory for the male partner to take some of that parental leave, and they found that when they brought that policy in, that did more to close the wage gap between men and women than just about any other single thing. Thanks, Colin. Is it culture or policy? Is it culture or policy? policy. Um, I always come down, I think, I think policy helps to determine culture within a society. I've always believed that. Um, and I think that you've got to have good policy um, and good laws and so on. And that <coughs> steers us into being a country that is well, we've always prided ourselves of having equality of opportunity. Uh, we've got to, we have to reclaim that, in my view. Thanks very much. I'll ask Carol to uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> well, no question. That was enjoyed. <laughs> the number of questions we got after that, that got you going. So, on behalf of the club, Liz, I'd really like to thank you for coming here. It was it was just great because it was tight. You started in 1972 and we were suddenly here, but we really got the issues really clearly. As Sir Annan said, a very cogent argument and compelling around what are the issues that are in the benefit not just of the individuals involved and the social justice there and the impact that could have on many important factors in this country, like poverty in New Zealand, but also, um, as quite rightly pointed out, better care for those who are involved. Could you all please all join me and thank Liz very much. Liz with a wife and two daughters, I've got a lot to report back on uh, tonight. Thank you. Uh, members with interesting uh, events, please. And uh, I know Tony's uh, wishes to cover scope, uh, and I'm presuming uh, singers to listen for in the wines option evening. Thank you, President. Uh, just to remind you, please, that the uh, early bird for singers to listen for exp expires on Wednesday, the 20th. Tickets at that stage go from $120 to $140. We've sold, as of this morning, 60 tickets. So we're, we're doing well, but I would encourage you, please, if you want to save $20 per ticket, to do that now. There are flyers on your tables if you've forgotten what the event is about. I would like to ask for your help, please, in selling corporate tables. 
we haven't sold any yet. And this club is very well connected in the community with businesses and so on. And the cost of the tables is negotiable, of course, as is the size, eight or ten people. Um, could you please see William or myself or Rebecca um, or, um, uh, for example, Olivia would, would be a good person to talk to as well, or Mark, if you run out of ideas as to who to ask for, they can refer it to me. So, um, very important to sell corporate tables so that we have a full muster. I'm doing a five minute talk about this event in a couple of weeks and can tell you what happened last night with the Lexus Song Quest, but I won't go to that now. Thank you. President Mark, guests and fellows, there's the yellow form on your table. Um, we'd like you very much to come to the wine options evening. Next week, we've been given a five minute slot and we will give you a little bit of an explanation about what happens for those for those people who have never been there before. Um, but we'll try and make that quite enjoyable. But if you'd like to um, register on the yellow form or uh, register through the uh, website, we'd look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. There's also, a, there's also that little yellow form for you to take away. There's a DL, DLE size form for you to take away if you want a reminder. President Mark, guests and fellows, just an update on SCOPE. For those of you who are unfamiliar with SCOPE, SCOPE is hopefully our next cohort of Rotarians. This is a group of young professionals aged between 25 and 35 that myself, Mark Stevens, Yui Mora and uh, Andrew Jackson as uh, chair of the youth committee have been working on to uh, introduce these young people to the Rotary thinking and to Rotary participation. Um, we've been working for the last probably 12 months just getting scope into some sort of shape and last Wednesday night we had the launch uh, down at Foxglove. Um, it was a pretty lousy night if you remember so we were delighted when about 30 or 40 young professionals turned up uh, to participate in some nibbles and drinks and to hear uh, Tanya Scott, who is the leader of the Young Professionals uh, or the, uh, of the SCOPE group, um, outline what SCOPE was about. Uh, we had a very interesting talk from Gaylene Hill, who is the principal of Linden School. And you'll remember that we uh, at the club uh, helped SCOPE finance a 3D printer and um, 10 Chromebooks into Linden School. The, the talk from Gaylene came straight from the heart and it really was um, a really gratifying talk to hear the, the extent to which the children have benefited from having those tools available. Uh, Gaylene was saying that the kids squirrel the, the, um, the uh, Chromebooks away during interval to make sure nobody else can get their hands on them uh, so that they can keep doing their work. But for a lot of these kids at uh, Linden School, it's the first technology they've ever seen. When we uh, uh, took the 3D printer with Sir Richard Taylor to the school to introduce it, um, uh, they, they brought along a little pile of uh, equipment or, or uh, devices that had been made on the 3D printer. And as I was standing alongside them, these little kids are coming up and saying, can I take one of those home? Can I take one of those home? And I said, listen, mate, in a couple of weeks' time, you'll be making your own. And they are, and they're thoroughly enjoying it. Um, once the term starts again, I'm going down to uh, just see what they're making on the 3D printer, but uh, we're talking about making an image of Tawa on the 3D printer. So we're going to um, get a, 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 photo, a photograph of Tawa and let them build uh, that model of Tawa uh, using the 3D printer, something to uh, educate. So these are young primary school kids who are coming to up to speed with technology at a great rate. Uh, these, as Sir Richard Taylor said, are the future employees at Weta Workshop and it's a real pleasure for the club to be involved. The other night the club was well represented, Kerry came along uh, as past president, uh, Mark Stevens was there, Yuri Mora and Andrew Jackson. Uh, it was a great night um, and uh, I think we've got great hopes of seeing a lot of these young people. Our database is 600 uh, names long so I'm hopeful that in the next few years we'll see all of this group, a lot of this group, uh, start to enter into the Rotary Club of Wellington. It's outstanding what our club gets up to and I congratulate all of the people who are driving uh, those uh, activities. 
Uh, one update since John was up here, just uh, for singers to listen for, and there are four outstanding singers, you can pick tickets up from uh, the secretary just outside. So if you wish, please uh, pick them up on the way uh, out. Uh, can I have this slide, please? Uh, what we're aiming to do is uh, also cover what we want to do in the next few meetings. The Ro Inter Rotary International has now said it recognises members find it difficult to get to each uh, meeting. Uh, it's the realism of, uh, of busy lives. Uh, their preferences try to get to at least one and two. Uh, we're going to advertise the next six weeks ahead so you can sort of try and aim to get to a key uh, speaker. And off this you can see uh, next week we've got Wellington Airport which is the way forward for planes coming to Wellington. It's a look holistically at everything to do with uh, what is a key uh, component of Wellington City. Uh, then you've got uh, Meridian Energy and the theme is the el electricity industry in New Zealand outdated, about to be revol revolutionised by innovative new technology. Uh, not yet, it'll be a fascinating piece because it is a, a tipping point uh, in technology. Uh, and then we've got um, uh, Dr Barry Gordon on the promotion of uh, sport and the promotion of positive socialisation. Uh, and then Charles, as you probably appreciate of a Brexit, was on national television uh, talking about uh, the advantages or disadvantages for New Zealand and Charles is going to come along and do that. Uh, then Andrew Little uh, is coming along on the 22nd uh, and uh, uh, Lady Susan, I'll put the title roughly as the Labour Party 100 years on and still looking, uh, still backing the Kiwi dream, somewhere in that um, piece. Uh, and then on the 29th, which is our fifth Monday, uh, the mayoral candidates are coming along to uh, talk to all of us. And that's where we can bring family and friends uh, along too. So please pick two or three of those to make sure you do uh, come along. I congratulate uh, Lady Susan, Lee, Ramsey for... Uh, this and the driving force of the news, the new newsletter, trying to sort of uh, make sure you're all aware of what's coming uh, up next. Uh, uh, in closing, we all have a, ro a role for membership, and please do use those little cards and encourage people uh, to come along. Uh, and in the history or quote uh, from today, um, New Zealand uh, can fall behind this week and. Uh, on the 20th of July 1960, uh, Ms. Samavo uh, Banda uh, Raniki became the world's first ever elected government head when she was sworn in as Salon's Prime Minister, Foreign Minister and Minister of Defence. And that's 1960, so uh, we've come a long way, but yet we haven't. So it requires all of us to keep uh, the driving force uh, for that. Uh, as we finish, don't forget our theme is uh, Rotary Serving Humanity. Please go out and make a difference. Uh, see you whenever you can in the next few weeks.